Well, good afternoon. Welcome to the All of Us Research Program office hours. Um, we're very excited um, for our speaker today. But before we get started, I do have a few announcements that I would just like to share with the group so that you can pass along to your colleagues or other AOU um, or all of us researchers in your community. So the first thing I wanna announce is that we are accepting abstracts for our 2024 All of Us Researchers Convention. So the convention is a free virtual event that will be held in April and is open to all researchers of the researcher workbench, but the abstract deadline is coming up next week. So if you are interested in submitting your abstract for the researchers convention, I will post a link just in a moment or you can go to researchallofus.org slash convention. It'll also just give you, if you're new to the researchers convention or never participated before, it'll give you some more high level details about the convention. Um, there's also a call for papers from the Journal of American uh, Medical Informatics Association, and they're actually speak, uh, seeking papers about all of us um, and all of us research. So if it includes topics from communities, community-based organizations, scientists and analysis that have to do with health concerns in uh, broader communities or the way that you engage with those communities, so those um, submissions are due by April 6th. So you can see the link here and I will also put that in the chat. So we're very excited about that opportunity. So today's presentation is interactive. So if you would like, um, we have a public link available that gives you access to Dr. Shear's slides. So if you wanna scan that QR code or I'll put the link um, in the chat in just a moment, if you wanna go through um, the slides with us and participate in the exercises. So now I'm gonna introduce our speaker, Dr. Kathy Shear. She's a postdoctoral research fellow at the Department of Biomedical Informatics here at Vanderbilt University Medical Center. And she is mentored by our very own Dr. Paul Harris, who is the corresponding principal investigator of the All of Us Data and Research Center. Um, she received her PhD in biostatistics from Harvard University in 2022. And her current research interest includes developing tools to illuminate the landscape of clinical trial eligibility for the diverse all of us participant population and statistical machine learning methods to advance for your disease research. So we're very, very excited to have Dr. Kathy Shear present today. So I'll start sharing my, stop sharing my screen and allow her to present her information. Awesome, thank you so, so much, Sam, for that very kind introduction. Hi, everyone. I'm really excited to be here today and thank you so much for joining. Um, so today's office hours will be really be a high level overview of how to work with EHR data um, on the All of Us Researcher Workbench. And so this is the agenda for today. Um, so we're gonna kick off um, by doing an overview of EHR data. And then we're going to dive into a little bit more details about working with OMOP. So OMOP is a common data model or a data standard that the all of us uses to standardize the medical terminology and also to store EHR data. Next, we're gonna shift gears a little bit um, and do a little bit of exercise on and learn to how to do cohort building on the researcher workbench. Um, so if at any point during the presentation, if you have any questions, please feel free to raise your hand um, or type your questions into the chat. My colleagues, uh, Chris and Sam, uh, will be helping me out in the chat. Um, awesome, so let's get started. So electronic health records or EHR um, is a digital version of a patient's paper chart. And typically EHRs can contain patients' demographics information, medical diagnoses, drugs, procedures, visits or encounters, laboratory tests, devices, images, or clinical notes. And broadly, I like to think of them as two major categories. The data can be divided into structured data. So structured data, when I think about that, I think about data that can be stored as a table. So think about you know an Excel spreadsheet. Um, on the other hand, we also have images and clinical notes, which are unstructured data that cannot be directly stored as a table. So in the All of Us research program, working with electronic health records really begins with the participant's consent process. So on the left-hand side of the screen, I've got a screenshot of a sample EHR form um, of the consent uh, form. So 
In this form, participants are asked for their consent to let the program reach out to their healthcare providers to share their EHR with us. So if the participant agrees, then the program will use this consent form to ask their healthcare provider, whether that would be at an academic um, medical institution um, or local community health clinic for their EHRs. One thing I do want to highlight is that all of us is not a substitute for medical care. And so as a result, the program is not subject to HIPAA or other US regulations that protect sensitive health information. However, the data, the EHR data that is shared with the program are protected by very rigorous privacy rules, um, which I'll explain in just a moment. So broadly, um, all of us takes very, very great care to perform the identification, meaning that the program removes the names and other identifying information from the participants EHR data and all other types of data as well. We follow all US federal, state and local laws and regulations for keeping information safe. Um, and on the researchers front, they must undergo rigorous training and agree to a number of rules. And one of these rules is promising that they will not try to find out who the participants are, um, meaning that they will not try to use the data and try to re-identify the participants. So for our access model, we have a tiered um, uh, setup and there are three main tiers. The first tier is the public tier. So in the public tier, the, we only offer, provide summary statistics and they can be accessed without having to log in or sign up or register um, with the program. The next two tiers um, are the register and the control tier. So these two tiers are live, they live on the Google Cloud platform, um, which is a secure platform um, that we only provide for trusted investigators. So the register tier is available to anyone within a trusted organization who proves their identity and enters into a data use agreement with the program. Now in this, um, in this tier, the data that is provided contains less detail. So it's a little bit more coarse. So with less detail, there's a lower risk of re-identification. Now, if we look to the right of the screen in the register tier, uh, users will have access to survey, EHR, physical measurement, and wearables data. The last tier is the control tier, and the control tier is available to trusted investigators, um, and they would have to undergo additional training and log in through a multi-factor authentication service like login.gov. In the control tier, the data have more detail, so more fine grain, um, but the trade-off is that there is more risk of re-identification. Um, so we really want to make sure that the investigators um, that we provide control tier data to um, are really trustworthy. So if we look to the right of the screen um, in the control tier, so in addition to all the data you have in the register tier, um, you will have access to genomics data, additional fields from the EHR and survey data, as well as unshifted dates. So what does that really mean? Let's um, take a look at this example here. So here I've got a table that's comparing the register versus the control tier. And that the first column contains a list of demographic fields. Um, so there are um, three major takeaways. The first is that the control tier provides unchanged information. So if we look at all of the dates, so date of birth, date of events, date of death, in the register tier, the dates will all be randomly shifted by one year while preserving the temporality in the data. However, in the control tier, we don't change any of that information. The second takeaway is that the control tier contains additional data that's not provided in the register tier. So for example, cause of death, living situation, active, uh, mil active duty military status and genomic data are all suppressed or not provided in the register tier but they are in the control tier. Um, last but not least, the control tier provides more fine grain information. So for example, for some demographic fields uh, like race, ethnicity, sex, and gender, in the register tier, we may generalize some of the participants' responses. However, we do not make any changes or amendments in the control tier. Um, so the control tier definitely provides more fine grain information.
um, a very, very helpful resource um, that I found to be really, really um, useful when I'm doing research on the workbench is the All of Us um, Data Dictionary. And it's really helpful for um, researchers to learn you know, how the fields are specifically defined in the All of Us data set and whether or not they have been amended for privacy reasons. So before we shift gears and talk about OMOB, are there any questions um, from the first section? All right, awesome. So let's talk about OMOP. So OMOP or Observational Medical Outcomes Partnership um, is an open community data standard. So it's maintained by the Observational Health Data Sciences Informatics or Odyssey. Um, so OMOP is really important because I think that if you want to be able to truly harness the power of EHR data in all of us, that you really have to have a solid understanding of how OMOP is storing the data and standardizing the data. So there's two main components. One is storage and second is standardization. So let's dive into a little bit more detail um, for, for each, um, for both of these. So let's talk about storage first. So the EHR data on all of us are stored in a relational database. And so here I've got this schema. There's a lot going on. So let me help you um, break it down a little bit. So here we see six color rectangles. These color rectangles represent different categories or dimensions of EHR data. So for example, if we look at the clinical data, um, we see information about the person or the patient um, about their observation period, death information, visit occurrence, uh, drug exposure, et cetera, et cetera. And now moving over to the right, we also have information about their health system. So where was the care provided? What was the care site? Um, who were the providers, et cetera, et cetera. Now within each color rectangle, the smaller rectangles with the white background, they represent tables. So really we can just think of them as each one of them as a separate spreadsheet. So what does that really mean? Let's look at an example. So let's take a closer look at two tables, um, the condition occurrence table and the measurement table. So if we were to work with all of us EHR data, in essence, they, they're really just tables and spreadsheets. Um, and so they've, Got, so each row corresponds to participants, and then each column um, represents a specific variable. Now, if we go back, we see a lot of arrows that are going across and, and connecting these different tables. So if an arrow connects to rectangles, then that means there is a key variable that is present in both tables that links the two tables. So let's go back to our example. Um, and look at, again, the condition occurrence and the measurement tables. So can someone tell me what is the key variable here that can be used to link the two tables? And feel free to, it's yeah, go ahead. ID. Person ID. Yeah, yeah, it's a person ID, exactly. Um, so the person ID is a, is, is a variable that is present. It's common to both tables and and, and then when you're doing analysis, you um, a lot of times you will rely on that key variable for you to merge multiple tables. So in essence, what that means is that you can learn about, you know, the person's condition occurrence um, and their measurement. So you can merge multiple tables um, for your analysis. So um, a helpful resource that I would like to point out um, is this link here. It's a list um, of the OMOP tables and all of the different variables. And so actually I'll just, um, so if you wanna follow on, feel free to click on that link. Um, so this link will take you to this web page. And, and if we look on the left, this is a, the list of all of the clinical data tables that we just saw. So let's take a look at the person table. So this table is essentially the table that contains records to uniquely identify each participant um, in the data set. 
And if we scroll down, the first column essentially are the names of the different variables that are in that column. So we have person ID, which is the uh, unique identifier for each participant. Then we've got information about their gender, you know, year of birth, um, et cetera, race, uh, and ethnicity. So let's go back to the slides um, and we're gonna work through a really quick exercise. Um, so let's take a look at our friend John Doe. Um, this is not a real participant. So John, um, on July 1st, 2018, um, he was diagnosed with type two diabetes. Um, and then at that same visit, he had his A1C measured at the lab. Shortly after, um, he was prescribed metformin. And then on a follow-up visit on October 7, 2018, he continues to get his A1C measure and he continues to take his metformin. So here's the first um, exercise. I want everyone to try this out as well. So given John's patient journey, which OMOP tables would you look at to find information on the following components um, of his uh, patient journey? So Sam, if you could, awesome, Sam, yeah, go ahead. For metformin, we can try looking at the medication table. Okay, and yeah. Type, type two diabetes can be found in condition occurrence and A1C yeah. could be the measurement. Yes, perfect. So um, so I'll, I'll, I'll give maybe pause for 10 seconds just for everyone else to, um, to try this out. I see a couple of answers um, in the chat as well. Um, so let's, let's go back and do this as a group. Um, so let me go back to this table. So thank you so much for answering, Sonia. So for metformin, the table that we want to look at is drug exposure. Right, so this is a table that really captures all the records about a patient's exposure to a drug that was ingested or otherwise that was introduced to a body, okay? Um, now, the second um, thing that we wanted to look at was type two diabetes. So for type two diabetes, um, the OMOP table that we wanna look at for that is condition occurrence. So this table contains records of events of a person suggesting the presence of a disease or a medical condition stated as a diagnosis. And last but not least, um, for the A1C measurement, that would fall under the OMOP table of measurement. So the measurement table contains all of the structured data about a person's laboratory tests, vital signs and quantitative findings from pathology reports, et cetera. Okay. Awesome. So any questions about um, exercise one? Yeah, hi. Uh, yeah, hi. So if, you are, if you are going to do it, uh, diabetic uh, analysis, then you should do yeah. all the three? Oh, yeah, that's a great question. Um, so it, it really depends on your scientific question. Um, so if you are, you know, in, let's say you're interested in studying a cohort, um, you know, that looks like John, you know, who has, who have been exposed to metformin, who have had their A1C measured, um, and who are diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, then these three um, different OMOP tables are going to be where you're going to be pulling the data from. But, you know, let's say, you know, you want to look at people who have type 2 diabetes, but maybe for a different um, drug, not metformin, um, then you may not have to specifically look at metformin. But if you want to look at anything drug related, chances are you will have to, um, you know, be pulling data out of the drug exposure OMOP table, right? So the, the, pur the purpose of this exercise is, is really to um, familiarize everyone with the different types of OMOP tables and thinking about the different dimensions or the domains in the EHR data and where um, where in the OMOP table you might be able to find that information. Does that help answer your question, Anjana? Yeah, yes, yes. Uh, I, I okay. would like to follow up one more question. So what my understanding is, if I choose A1C measurement, yeah. 
and yeah uh, one of the criteria it will pretty much include all the patient with type 2 diabetes as well as with the different drug exposure and it, it will give me a wider range is that yeah. correct right okay. so um I, i think later we will actually do another exercise where i think it might help you uh, understand a little bit better about how to refine your inclusion exclusion criteria but if you um only look at participants who have a one c measurement then you will only be querying the database for participants who have an who have an a1c measured that says nothing about what their a1c value was it's just anyone who had their a1c measured you will be pulling pulling those uh, participants from from the data set okay okay thank you thank you. sure of course um okay so let i have a uh, sorry yeah. uh, i yeah, think uh, i think i missed your presentation like I start one, but I have a one yeah. question because I'm a like a new on the all of us. So my yeah. uh, my aim is to generate a drug cohort like the okay. like for metformin drug cohort for yeah. Yeah. the all number of the users, and then to yeah. like that to see the effect on the type two diabetes along with yeah. all other comorbidity. So sure. I try to do this, but like, is there yeah. any tutorial or any way or like exercise I can? look over it and then get all the information yeah. about like the metformin users or the other users. absolutely absolutely i i think um i think we'll go through a couple more exercises i think the last exercise should be answer, uh, should be at least um helpful to for answering your question but if you still have um that question at the end please feel free to um you know um uh, unmute and ask okay. um towards it awesome thank you all right okay. so thank you. um of course yeah all right so let, let's move on um to the next uh, part. So that was a little bit about um how OMOP stores the data, right? So it stores data as a relational database, right? Um so now let's move on and talk about how OMOP standardizes the medical terms or the medical concepts um in all of us. So there are six major OMOP EHR domains. Um drugs, conditions, procedures, devices, observations and measurements. and omop standardizes the vocabulary um or the terminology in each domain and so if we look at this little schematic at the bottom of the slide um what this is showing is that for the conditions domain so let's let's just focus on one of the six domains for now um the standard vocabulary in the conditions domain is snowmed so what does that really mean um so As you may know, all of us um collects data from healthcare providers um uh, across the United States. And different healthcare providers and organizations may use different terminology um to code a the same concept. So for example, one uh, let's say hospital A may use ICD-9, but hospital B may use ICD-10-CM. So ICD-9, ICD-10 these are um basically um a a vocabulary for standardizing billing codes. Okay. So the idea in OMOP and all of us is that we want to make sure that these different vocabularies are mapping or standardized to a single vocabulary, right? So we basically are speaking the same language here, right? So for the conditions domain, the standard vocabulary is snowmen in the sense that all of these source vocabularies, ICD-9, CD-10, MESH, uh Nebraska lexicon etc cetera, etc cetera. they all map to uh concepts in snowmen okay so a second helpful resource is athena so athena is a web page for browsing standardized vocabularies in omop so let's go ahead and uh, i'm just going to show everyone what this looks like um so this is a web page and it's very um very simple to use so for example if you're interested let's say in studying uh a population participants with afib for example um so the search results will be displayed in this list format so the first column here is the id column so this is the concept id it's just um a string of numbers the second column is the code it's the concept code also a string of numbers i will talk about the difference between the two in just a few minutes then you have the concept name um afib this is a clinical finding it's a standard concept 
it's valid um, and it um, belongs to the condition domain and it belongs to the vocabulary SNOMED. So remember in the slide just now, I, I said that the standard vocabulary for condition domain is SNOMED, right? So this concept here is the standard concept. Now, if we look at the second entry, right, we see it's essentially the same concept name. It's also AFID, right? But we have a different concept ID, different concept code. We see that this is a non-standard concept. Why? Well, because the source vocabulary is mesh. So, so in, in OMOB, and when we're working with EHR data um, in all of us, um, typically you will be working with the standard concept. So uh, it's it's really helpful to always uh, know which which one is a standard vocabulary for each domain. So for conditions, um, the standard vocabulary is SNOMED. So let's get a little bit of practice. Um, so for exercise 2.1, we're going to use Athena. So everyone, if you have you know access to a laptop or if you're on your phone, um, go ahead and try to pull up the um, link um, that Sam has dropped in, in the chat. So. We're gonna, again, follow John again on his journey. So using Athena, can someone tell me what the standard concept ID and the standard concept code are for type two diabetes mellitus? Feel free to type the answers in the chat or um, feel free to unmute as well. Okay, awesome. Yeah, I'm seeing a couple of um, answers in the in the chat. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, I, I think you 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 guys um, nailed it. So um, I'll just show everyone really fast. So the way to do it is you just type in type two or whatever condition you're interested in. Um, you can type in. So for here, it's type two diabetes mellitus. We see that you know this is the concept. ID 201826, the concept code is 40054006. Remember I asked for the standard concept ID and concept code, right? So we wanna make sure that this concept is standard um, standard because it's um, it, it came from the vocabulary snowman. So awesome. So um, that one is pretty straightforward. So let me go ahead and talk about the distinction between concept ID and concept code, right? So if we go back to Athena, we see, um, you know, the first two columns, uh, we, we saw concept ID, concept code. Um, so what's the difference and why do we need both of them? So here I, I've got a list of different concepts. So concepts about residential treatment, psychiatric, serum, simulating factors, antipyrene, et cetera, et cetera. And if we look to the right, we see that they all have the same exact concept code, a concept code of 1001. Um, so the thing here is that this concept code um, is used to describe concepts from different vocabularies, right? So the same concept code, of course, mapping to multiple uh, concepts. So if you have a collaborator who tells you, hey, I'm interested in exploring, um, you know, building a cohort of people who have the concept code of 1001, you're not going to know what concept they're talking about, you know, unless they tell you what vocabulary it was, perhaps. Um, so that's why it's really important to have the concept ID, because the concept IDs uniquely identify a concept in OMA. So if you're working with the collaborators and they're saying, hey, I'm interested in looking at this drug ingredient and let me give you the concept ID, um, then that will uniquely tell you which concept they're looking at. Okay. So that, that's a little bit of a um, kind of a high level explanation of, of the difference between the concept ID and concept code. Um, so now let's um, revisit our friend, um, John. So on October 15th, um, he was, he reported having um, chest pains. And then in January, in January of the following year, you know, he continues to get his A1C measure. He continues to take his metformin and refill it. Um, and then he was also diagnosed with AFib. Okay. 
So exercise 2.2, and I want everyone to try this out too. So again, using Athena, find me the concept ID and the standard concept ID that corresponds to the ICD-9 code 427.31. Now this one is um, a little bit tricky. So go ahead and, and, and try to figure this one out on your own first, and we're going to come back as a group. Okay, um, let's see, Chelsea. Yeah, that is the right, right. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we've got a couple of answers in the chat here. Right, so does anyone want to unmute and, ex you know, explain kind of the process for, for finding, so let me, let me switch back to the, to the slides really fast. So, so we're looking for two things. The first is a concept ID. And the second one is the standard concept ID. Okay. I'm seeing essentially the same answer in the chat, but does anyone else have a different answer? This one is tricky. Okay, so so let's um, let's walk through it as a group. So again, think about we want the concept ID and the standard concept ID. Okay, yeah, awesome, Joseph, you got it. Yeah. Okay, so um, let's let me switch back to uh, Athena. So so the great thing about Athena is you know we can search AFib as a string or we can search the different codes. So in this case, I, I gave you guys a ICD nine code for twenty seven point three one. So 427.31, as you can see, so this is the first result in the search. Um, in the search. So 427.31 is the concept code. And the 448.21957 is the concept ID. But remember, right, we talked about this earlier, is thinking about standardization. Um, we know that ICD-9 code is not the standard vocabulary, right? SNOMED is the standard vocabulary. Um, and the question, the at least the second part, is asking um, us to find the standard concept ID, right? So this concept, so, so let's go ahead, let me just click into this here. So the 44821957, that is the concept ID. But it's not the standard concept ID because it's an ICD-9. It's the concept ID that corresponds to ICD-9 and not SNOMED. So on Athena, if you want to find the standard concept ID, you can look to the right. Um, so this table shows you the relationship between concepts. So what we want to um, look at is the non-standard to standard map, right? So it's a mapping from ICD-9 to SNOMED. So the standard concept ID here is 313217. So any questions about the difference between concept ID and standard concept ID and how you can go from one to the other? Um, the purpose of, of going through this exercise is that sometimes you might be working um, with a non-standard concept ID and uh, you will have to learn how to map it to the standard concept um, in OMOP so that you can use it to um, query the database and build cohorts. So, all right, so let's, um, so we're going to shift gears a little bit and talk about how to build cohorts on the researcher workbench. Um, so the researcher workbench is the all of us's cloud-based um, platform with a suite of tools to support data analysis and collaboration. Um, and so there are four main components um, to the researcher workbench, um, workspaces, notebooks, cohort builder, and the data set builder. So workspaces are used to access and store data um, and collaborate with others. Um, so you can think of a workspace as essentially a file cabinet where you store everything that you need for your analysis. Now in your workspace, you will have Jupyter notebooks. Currently, we only offer R and Python notebooks, and these um, are um, notebooks that can perform high power queries analysis. Now, um, the cohort builder and data set builder are our custom 
point and click tools for creating cohorts and building collections of health information about those cohorts. So there are two main approaches for building a cohort um, on the All of Us um, researcher workbench. The first, like I mentioned, is um, the cohort and data set builder. So these are very user-friendly point and click tools um, where you can specify the inclusion exclusion criteria to build a cohort. Um, they're also free to use, um, meaning that um, they do not require spinning up a cloud computing environment. Um, so what I like to use the cohort and data set builder for is really just to um, get an estimate of my cohort sample size before diving uh, into uh, my analysis. Now, the alternative is to go directly um, into the Jupyter Notebook um, and write the SQL code yourself. So SQL code is a com um, computer language that is used to um, work with and extract information from relational databases. So the second approach does require a basic understanding of SQL. Um, so there is a steeper learning curve, but the trade-off is that it does offer additional flexibility for cohort query. So we're gonna um, work with both today. So let's start with um, the cohort builder. Um, so, um, and then after you create a cohort, you can go ahead and create a data set. So go ahead and click on create a data set um, and you wanna select the cohort participants. So for me, I wanna select AFib test two. Um, and then next you can select the different concepts that you want. So for this one, let's look at um, demographics. Um, perhaps you're interested in, um, you know, the participants' healthcare access utilization um, or personal and family health history, et cetera, et cetera. And then on the right, you can also select or deselect specific columns. So for example, um, perhaps I'm not too interested in looking at gender, then I can, you know, deselect them. Um, and then here you can click on view preview table and that will show you a row level, um, uh, basically a display of participant level data, uh, but I won't do that today. So go ahead and click on create data set and we'll name it, you know, AFib test two um, and click save. Then you can click on analyze. So what this is going to do is now you can export this cohort to a Jupyter notebook where you will be able to analyze the data. So for example, um, let's just say AFib notebook test. And you can select the programming language. Um, so if we select R, uh, if you click on code preview, um, you're going to see on the right here um, that you're going to have a snippet of SQL code um, that will correspond to the inclusion exclusion criteria that we just specified. Um, so what you can do is then click export and then it will take you to a Jupyter notebook. It will automatically populate a Jupyter notebook for you um, to start your analysis. Okay, so let's go back to um, the slides. Um, so that was the first approach for building a cohort is using the point and click cohort and data set builder. Um, the next approach is um, directly going into the Jupyter notebook and you know, writing SQL code. So let's, um, so this is our final exercise. And we're gonna think about how we can build a cohort using SQL code. So the exercise here is to build a cohort of participants um, with the following characteristics in their EHR. So we want a cohort of participants with type two diabetes. So in the red here, these are the concept IDs. We want, oops, we want um, cohort participants with type 2 diabetes, A1C measurement, a greater than or equal to 7, um, and also metformin in their EHR. So the question of interest here, this is just as an exercise, is let's say you're interested in finding out how many participants are in this cohort. Okay, so we're going to think about how we can, you know, write SQL code to do this. Um, so... SQL code um, can be daunting to learn at first, but I think it becomes formulaic once you uh, really get the gist of it. And so here, I, I really want to share with you guys this mnemonic that I came up with, um, which is when it comes to writing SQL code, um, is to remember the what, the where, and the who. So in SQL code, you want to use the select statement to specify what variables you want. 
So what does that really mean? So for example, if we say select person ID, the output table that you will get is essentially just a spreadsheet, you know, with the column person ID, right? So now if we want to, you know, select um, additional things like race concept ID, ethnicity concept ID, um, then your output table will be populated with those variables. So think of whenever you're using, you know, um, writing SQL code for the select statement, you always want to think about for my output table, what are the specific column variables that I want? Okay, so that's the select statement. Now the from statement is used to specify where the concepts live in terms of the OMOP tables. Okay, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in the next slide. And the third one is the where. So the where statement specifies who the participants of interest are. So this is where we can specify our inclusion and exclusion criteria. Okay, so let's take a look at what the SQL code looks like. Okay, there's a lot on this slide, but um, we'll walk through it uh, line by line. So if we you know, look back at the exercise, we're interested in building a cohort participants with, with these three attributes in their EHR. The question of interest is how many participants are in your cohort, right? So when we think about the select statement, right, the what piece, what do we want, you know, in our output data set that can help us answer that question, right? I mean, one thing I can think of is really just get a list of person IDs, right? Um, but not just a list of person IDs, a list of unique person IDs, um, so there are no overlap. So for the select statement, the what is going to be the distinct person IDs. Now the syntax here, the condition occurrence dot person ID corresponds to table dot column, right? So we're extracting the person ID column from this table. Okay, so now let's talk about the where. So remember in the beginning, we did, you know, um, an exercise where we were looking at the different OMOP tables and we were thinking about, hey, for metformin, for A1C, for type 2 diabetes, which OMOP tables did these, con did these um, concepts come from, right? So that's really the from statement. So we want um, to extract a cohort of participants who have type 2 diabetes. So remember in that exercise, we, um, that information is contained in the condition occurrence table, right? So basically what this is saying is that I want to extract from, um, so in this data set, the condition occurrence table. And then after the back ticks, um, this is where you can, you know, rename the table um, using the alias. So I'm just using the same exact name. So I'm just using um, condition occurrence as is. Then I also want the measurement table, right? Because I want information about their A1C. So then I also want the measurement table and I also want the drug exposure table. So three tables, but I want to be able to merge all three of them. So in SQL, you can use the join command to merge multiple tables. So what this is doing um, is taking the condition occurrence table and the measurement table and joining them by person ID, right? So join on condition occurrence person ID equals measurement person ID, right? So what is that doing exactly? So remember, if we think back again to, think back to the uh, previous exercise where we talk about the relational structure of the database, um, that we have multiple linked tables and we can think of them as spreadsheets and we've talked about the key that links multiple tables. And so when we're doing this join, essentially what we're doing um, is finding the intersection of participants, you know, who have an entry in their condition occurrence table, who have an entry in their drug exposure table, who also have an entry in their measurement table. So we're really looking at this intersection here. Now, there are different types of joins um, in SQL. So there's left join and right join, inner join, outer join. But if you just specify join, that is a shorthand for inner join. So you're really looking at the intersection here. Okay. So now let's talk about um, the where, uh, right? I so have a, 
yeah i have a question here so yeah. I, i understand that that like here we are just using the inner joint but uh, we can always yeah. have this you know scope of using the left joint or the full joint as well of course yeah okay. exactly exactly in that case the order matters a little bit but because yeah. we're just looking at the, yeah exactly that's a great question okay thank you so of course yeah um so for the where statement this is where we want to specify the inclusion exclusion criteria right so who are the participants Well, we know who they are because we specifically said we want participants with type 2 diabetes, right? And so here what we are specifying is that for condition occurrence dot condition concept ID equals 201A26. So 201A26 is the um, OMOP concept ID for type 2 diabetes. Now you might be saying, okay, wait a minute, you know, I recognize condition occurrence because that's the name of the table that we looked at, but where did you get condition occurrence? concept ID. Um, well, I, I think that's why I think um, the list of OMOP tables is so helpful because if we click on condition occurrence um, and you look at the different um, column names, right? So this is the name of that specific column. So essentially it's what is the concept ID for a condition, right? So you want to use that to specify Um, the specific condition that you're looking at, which in our case is type 2 diabetes. Um, okay, so we want people with type 2 diabetes. That's great. We also want people with A1C measurement. So this is where we specify. So measurement dot measurement concept ID. Remember the syntax is table dot column name, right? So we want to specify that. We know that um, the concept ID that I've provided here for A1C is 3004410. So how do you find this concept ID? use Athena, right? Um, okay, so, but we don't want, we, you know, we don't want anyone with A1C. We specifically want people with an A1C value greater than or equal to seven. And so then you want to additionally specify measurement dot value as number greater than or equal to seven. Then you might be, wait a minute, where did you get value as number? Well, go back to the list of OMOP tables, right? So if we go to measurement table, uh, you might think, okay, I want to, you know, I want a column that will help me find people who have a specific value uh, in their measurement. So you can, you know, look at, so a lot of times, especially when you're just starting out, a lot of it is just browsing through these tables and really kind of building an intuition of, um, you know, where you should be pulling the data from. And so here you can see this is value as number, and this is a numerical value of the results and the measurement available, okay? Then last but not least, we also want people who um, have metformin in their EHR. And so here again is the concept ID. Um, and so we know that for metformin, that belongs to the drug exposure table. So here we specify drug exposure dot drug, expo uh, drug concept ID, right? So table dot, column name is equal to 401, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so once you have this SQL code, then um, you know once you run it, you can, um, on the workbench, you will be able to answer this question. Um, so, okay, so that was a really quick overview and it's really just to help everyone build some intuition. So yeah, questions? I have a very quick question. I, it may yeah. sound a little dumb. So just you have used like um, more or less like the, you know, all the standardized SNOMED uh, identifiers, yeah. for diabetes, AC. What if I would like to use that, like, you know, instead of using the SNOMED code, I just wanted to do my table join using the type 2 diabetes as a classifier. Um, I'm, I'm just I'm asking. Sorry, yeah, yeah. Go so ahead. I'm, I'm saying that you have like more or less for all these three measurements, what is like yeah. type 2 yeah. diabetes, A1C, and yeah. metformin, you have this, you know, standardized mm -hmm. yeah. SNOMED code. So uh, what if I join my table or create my join, uh, table instead of using this code, just using like, you know, condition equals to di type 2 diabetes. Yeah. Uh, measurement concept. Uh, it's like A1C measurement lesson. Like, can we do mm -hmm. like this or we always need the standard uh, codes for these uh, variables? Um, so here, what I'm providing, these are the OMOP concept IDs. You can also specify like the the concept name. So instead of typing in like numbers, you can type in type 2 diabetes mellitus, but you have to make sure um, that in, you know, OMOP, 
you have to make sure you, you know, capitalize things correctly. And, you know, it has to be the exact same concept name as it is coding OWAP, if that makes sense. And so when you're doing the, um, the selection, you would do, you know, condition underscore occurrence. And then you wouldn't use a condition concept ID. I think you might be, um, it, it, you might not be able to use the concept name directly. You might have to do a little bit of merging with the concept table, mm -hmm. um, which contains the concept name. So in my opinion, I, I think I prefer in, from my experience to just work directly with the concept codes mm -hmm. Or got sorry, it. the concept IDs, not a concept code. Got it. Okay. And it may be because like um, you know, the kind like maybe type two yeah. diabetes can be written in different format, like yes, exactly. D with yeah. Capital D. Okay, got it. Yeah, Thank exactly. You. Right. Of course. Yeah. So that um pretty much concludes um our session today. I'll I'll happy to answer additional questions. I do want to point to additional resources that you have uh in your slide deck, the user support hub and future workspaces. Uh, as well as additional office hours and live events that we offer at the DRC. So thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Shear. It was a very informative session. Um, so I know we're about to be right at time. So if you do have to drop off this call, feel free. Um, I noticed a few people asked me, will this recording be available? Yes. If you go to the video section on the user support hub, it will be posted within the next week, along with the slide deck as well for your reference. Um, and then I got a few questions that I will quickly answer. Um, how do I query the select time of diagnosis? So within the condition occurrence table, there's a field name called condition um, date time or condition. It'll say condition start date time or condition end date time. Date time is going to pull the date and the timestamp. Um, the date is just going to pull the date. So you'll just have to query that field. Um, or if you're using um, the interface there, once you get into the data set builder, on the very last column, you have the option to select that field variable um, if you want to have the date information there. And then I got another question about, is it better to find standard codes before searching for co uh, um source codes. So the way that the All of Us Research Program, again, is structured is by standard codes. So we do have more information um, utilizing standard codes. You're also able to toggle and look via source codes, but we have a lot of the information that most researchers need by using the standard codes alone. Okay. So um, are there handouts users guys for a walk step-by-step uh, -step walkthrough of the cohort builder, data set builder? That's a great question. So on the user support hub under the getting started tab, you will have a article that does give a walkthrough of both the cohort builder and the data set builder. So you can see that information there. Um, we also do provide um, one -on not one-on-one -on -one support, but some support in drop-in office hours on Tuesdays, which is for registered researchers of the researcher workbench. So feel free to come to those. Um, can you work with multiple data? Yes, and we encourage it. So the wonderful thing about the All of Us Research Program is the person ID that Dr. Shear was um, mentioning is um, stays consistent across data types. So you can pull survey information and electronic health information, um, and then you can merge those two data frames on the person ID to see the information you would like. Um, yes, the video will be available for attendees. And then how can you incorporate variables uh, pertaining to concurrent medications and concurrent diseases? So um, as Dr. Shear mentioned, you would probably look at both the measurement, not measurements, the drug exposure table and the condition occurrence table. Um, a few researchers in the past have looked at the start date of a drug and the start date of condition to make up assumptions about when the start date of the drug and condition correlate to each other. So that will be up to you and your study design when you're wrangling the data in your notebook. Um, and then I do, I think a really good supplement after you've gotten familiar with SQL and the structure of the All of Us program, we do have a tutorial about um, wrangling data in the works, uh, workbench that one of our data scientists shared. Um, so after you get familiar with the information and you're saying, okay, now I've queried the data, I have my data frame, now what? This um, video that I just posted talks about data wrangling in R. Um, we don't have a video of data wrangling in Python, but we do have a featured workspace. So that might be the next best, best step if you're, if you're new to the All of Us program and wanting to get started with the project. Okay. 
Well, that is all from us today. Thank you, Dr. Shear, again for being here and giving us such valuable information. I'll stay on for another minute or two if there's any straggling questions, but otherwise, thank you for your attendance and we'll see you at the next event.